there'd been a long history of heavy-handed policing and police violence. A special investigation from the Minneapolis Star Tribune and Frontline, from the murder of George Floyd. It's just a combustible situation. To the trial of Derek Chauvin. It's not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. And the struggle for accountability. We should and can abolish our current Minneapolis police system. Now streaming on PBS. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our conversation, Police Policy and Community Progress in the Aftermath of George Floyd. I'm your host, Rainey Aronson Roth, the Editor-in-Chief and Executive Producer of Frontline. I'd first like to thank CAM, the Center for Asian American Media, for co-hosting this presentation with us in support of Frontline's Equity Fund, an initiative that provides resources and inclusion for BIPOC filmmakers. Our discussion today will look at one of the most critical moments on policing and race in America. Reporting on this issue is featured in our film, Police on Trial, a collaboration with award-winning reporters from the Star Tribune, our local journalism partner. The film documents the early days and the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin, and the community's struggle for accountability. I'm joined today by a panel who will help us understand the complexities of police reform, consequential political decisions, and how citizens and leaders grappled with issues around justice, healing, and the pathway forward. To start, let's take a look at an important moment that opens the film. I was working a holiday shift, and I got this cryptic text from the police spokesperson telling me about a news conference outside of City Hall. So I went down there. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and realized that the suspect was suffering a medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center where he died a short time later. I was posting regular updates on Twitter saying that there were all sorts of unanswered questions about this incident. And it was around that time that someone on Twitter, a follower of mine, said, hey, there's a video that's floating around out there. You may want to check it out. <laughs> it was pretty surreal because it seemed to directly contradict what the uh, initial police account said. There was no mention of being pinned under an officer's knee. He's not me that I see that room. Took me a second to sort of process what I was watching. You realize that there's far more to this case than they initially let on. It raised a lot of doubts or questions in a lot of people's minds of how many other incidents in the past had been shaped or sanitized by the cops. For our discussion, I'm so pleased to introduce our guest, Mike Shum, the director of Police on Trial, where you just heard the clip from. Marcia Robu, who is the producer and reporter of Police on Trial and Charlie Adams, a police inspector with the Minneapolis Police Department. I really appreciate you all joining me today as we reflect on incredibly important issues in the wake of George Floyd. Thank you for all being here. So in the clip we've just reviewed, we heard from Star Tribune, uh, from the Star Tribune reporter, um, and the team there had been covering George Floyd's case from the very start. And of course you can see that they even won a Pulitzer Prize, Mike. I was hoping you could start us off with, how did you actually connect with them and how did you start filming? Well, I had just moved to uh, actually the Twin Cities not long uh, before the pandemic and before uh, George Floyd's murder. So I was actually pretty unfamiliar with uh, the area. And I had worked with the New York Times uh, several times previous to doing this film such that uh, when uh, George Floyd was murdered and the protests ensued, I was out there filming for uh, the New York Times video unit. At the same time, I wasn't very clear on the history and what had been happening 
uh, in Minneapolis at that time. And so for myself, I did as much research as I could. And honestly, the one who knew the most and had the most context was Labor Janey uh, from the Star Tribune. And so I had reached out to him a couple of times and had a couple of coffees with him. And essentially, I'd seen a lot of Star Tribune reporters out in the streets, but Labor in particular, we struck up a, uh, not only a, a good uh, various conversations, but also just a friendship that allowed us to think more uh, completely about what's possible in terms of covering uh, public safety in Minneapolis at that time. And with Labor, I know that it didn't start out as a documentary film. You weren't thinking about that at first, but of course, Frontline was also supporting the Star Tribune and Labor's work um, specifically. And, you know, Sarah Childress, who was our senior editor at the time, kept telling us about Labor. And he really does, uh, he does symbolize a local reporter on the go and that kind of work being inside the community he was reporting on. How did you realize that he was the one that you could identify as somebody to help you understand this? Truly his experience. I mean, it, as much as it is his candor as well as uh, his perspective, just the weight of experience and thoughtfulness he had, it, it was, uh, there was no other real option really, uh, except for his, uh, his insight and his foresight uh, for what he was reporting on during that time and then the, the, the years forward as the film was being built. Great. So Marcia, you're a producer on the film. You also appear in the film. Talk to me about your experience and meeting Mike for the first time and starting to get going on it. Then you just became such an integral part of the filmmaking process. When I uh, joined forces with my film, it was still very early on. And at that point, it was a magazine piece um, focused on the trial against Derek Chauvin. And then as we did more reporting, you know, filmed closely with the Star Tribune reporters, we realized that there was a much bigger story here that would go beyond the headline of just the Derek Chauvin trial, because we were also competing with national, international news outlets who had descended upon Minneapolis to cover the trial against Derek Chauvin. Um, but I, what I think what was so critical about Labor's reporting for the past you know, many years at the Star Tribune is that he had this really incredible context. He had this deep knowledge of the community, of the inside of the police department. Um, and we really wanted to shine a light on that. Um, so, you know, we sort of developed a system where uh, we tag teamed some reporting where, you know, Labor had, you know, his work that he had to do with the Star Tribune, he had his dailies he had to put out, um, there was access he had, there was access that, you know, I had, and we, we were just able to tag team um, in a sort of way. But um, really when I came on, it was a 20 minute piece. <laughs> and um, as it I just grew, <laughs> as it grew and grew, uh, then I helped him uh, more and more with, with reporting and working alongside Labor as well. That's great. Um, Inspector Adams, you have spent a lot of time with uh, Mike and you spent a lot of time with the frontline team. How is it for you from the perspective of having lived through as an inspector and also as a, in the police department, how was it for you living through George Floyd in the aftermath? Well, you know, the after, you know, getting the call that morning from my boss to hear, look at a video that was on one of our uh, residents' uh, Facebook, you know, trying to watch it was tough. And you see uh, a guy sitting in the same uniform, a colleague, uh, with his knee on George Floyd's neck and hearing George Floyd plead for his life. It was tough. You know, afterwards, you know, coming down to City Hall, meeting with uh, community folks, you know, and, and Chief Aaron Dowdle right away making, you know, terminating the officers. And kind of in a sense thought, well, maybe that will kind of uh, calm folks down because he took immediate actions. Mm -hmm. But as days went on, obviously it didn't. So it was, mm -hmm. it was, some, it was a difficult couple of uh, weeks dealing with that, watching uh, the destruction in the city of Minneapolis, watching the third precinct go up in flames, just watching protests around the country and around the world. So it was tough. Mm. And in terms of the your other colleagues, and how, how did you all handle it? Did you talk about it transparently? Were you all 
talking about it or were you just surviving those moments, those early days? You know, I, I don't think we still have talked about it as, as, as a healing thing for officers mm-hmm. on this department. We lost over 300 officers behind this, right? A lot of uh, post PTSD claims that uh, the department uh, has. So we're trying to heal, but we have not got the professional help right now that we need to heal as a, as a group and understand uh, what, you know, what our role was in, in, in the death of George Floyd, but also, you know, the feelings we were getting from community and around the world. So it's, it's still tough, you know, after, you know, it's still tough trying to deal with that. I think we're starting to see some of the morale come back up with some of the officers. For me in North Minneapolis, the community has been very supportive towards my officers and towards me. And we feel that support and uh, that healing phase is starting to uh, begin with the community. So. Yeah, I mean, just following up on that, I'm just curious what types of internal and cultural shifts have taken place to provide reform in response to such transformative events over the past few years? I mean, it's been such a transformative time. You said you lost 300 police officers. I knew you had lost a lot. I didn't know it was 300. So what what have the reforms been like? Well, there's been a whole lot of uh, policy changes within the last two years. Uh, the the human, human right, state human rights department has filed a claim against us. So we're kind of under a, an agreement or, or a consent decree with the state to follow some of the recommendations from the state. Well, she, we should know in a couple of days from the federal consent decree what the feds want for us. So we'll have two organizations, uh, you know, looking, looking at us internally and, and basically, you know, directing how we police here in the city of Minneapolis. So um, let's watch another moment in the film that's really a remarkable moment, and we'll talk right after that. The visceral images of him taking his last breath on that video, that certainly would brought people out uh, to the streets in the first place. But what sustained or fueled some of these subsequent protests is that there'd been a long history of heavy-handed policing and police violence. We'd been chronicling that violence in a database of every person killed by law enforcement in Minnesota since the year 2000. Police shot and wounded Jamar Clark early Sunday in Community members asking for answers after a man was shot and killed by police. 24-year-old Edmund Fair was shot and killed by the officer during a traffic stop. We started working on this database back in 2015. In late 2015 is when Jamar Clark was killed by Minneapolis police. It was just the next year after that that Philando Castile was shot. Justine Damond shot after that. We knew that we had to provide a deeper context for people of how often this happens. By the time that George Floyd came around, there was just this certain numbness that this just keeps happening, it keeps happening. The point of the database is to show that these aren't just numbers. This was someone's brother, sister, mother, father. Mike, I'm wondering, watching that now, you have some hindsight. What's going through your mind as you're watching that? That's a good question. I mean, I, I would say watching that, what helps, at least as it pertains to what we were talking about before, is there was so much that I didn't know about mm-hmm. how, one, reporting had been going on for some time about the history of uh the struggle between law enforcement and and community, especially in, in uh, when it came to police involved killings uh, specifically, and with that, it allowed me a, a sort of historical knowledge walking in, and and mm-hmm. with you know people like Labor and Jeff Harvington and others and a- allowed me a little bit more context, uh, mm-hmm. because I do think when news coverage pops in, a lot of big buzzwords get thrown around and such, and for myself. I was pretty tired of that. I wanted to actually take the time to, to, to meet with meet with people, talk to people, really get a wider sense of something that I know is incredibly complicated and takes mm-hmm. more time and pressure to, under, pressure to understand like what reform actually looks like. And so when I look at that, those numbers are 
uh, speak volume. Yet what it tells me is that I need to know more uh, about the context of, of what we're filming. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I, I had a very similar feeling. And Marcia, I wanted to ask you too, like you're looking at that, you're an investigative reporter yourself. You're seeing that. What does that speak to you in terms of just the breadth and depth of what you all are looking at? Yeah, um, I think what's really interesting to me is that Minneapolis represents this duality where it is this, it has a reputation for being this proudly progressive city. It's been named as one of the most liberal cities in, in the country. And yet it's, have, it's had decades of um, trying to rein in this police force that's been accused of excessive force and uh, corruption um, and being politicized. I mean, this dates back to the 80s, really. Um, and, you know, Minneap the MPD has had um, Chief Arredondo, you know, who is a progressive and Black police chief, uh, Janae Harto, who is an openly gay Native American um, chief. Um, MPD has had a series of progressive um, police chiefs. And so the question for me is, you know, why did George Floyd, Floyd's murder happen in Minneapolis, this bastion of progressive reform and at a police department that's really been trying um, to, to rein in its, its force? Um, and so when I see um, the database that Jeff Hargitain has put together to start Tribune, it just reminds me of this, this cycle, it seems like, that MPD has been going through despite you know, all these policy changes, all of these great intentions all of these police chiefs who come in and really want to, um, you know, rein in some of the uh, more, you know, difficult elements within the force. Right. And I guess, Inspector Adams, you know what I'm going to ask you, how, how do you interpret this? And I want to know also, like, as you're watching this, are we being fair? You know, is this presentation fair? And are you feeling like, um, you know, the way that we covered that moment, right, which is a pretty, it's looking at the systemic issues fair. Well, you know, it's, it's tough because some of those cases that was mentioned, I, I did some internal affairs uh, investigations on and, you know, and sometimes the story doesn't come out the way it should be, right? Uh, we, we'll, we'll see somebody die at the hands of police but you know, we'll have an individual also who was armed who was shot and killed, and that's still a problem, right? So there's been so many unarmed shootings of, of, of African Americans in this country. We get mm -hmm. to the point we start putting everything together and thinking that every every killing is a bad killing, right? And every killing is a bad killing, but it's not. You know, we we don't think it's justified. Um, for longest, I've been talking about you know discrimination on the police department within the city of Minneapolis. I was one of five officers, along with Chief Aaron Dondo. They called us the Mill City Five, and we sued the city of Minneapolis based on a lot of things that people are talking about, discrimination, uh, you know, uh, racism within the police department, right? It's not like MPDs run around with a bunch of uh, rogue cops and, 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 and taking money from folks like that. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of times it's individual acts, right? But when you... When you have an officer doing that, he's wearing this particular uniform, we all get kind of uh, painted with the same brush and we're all put in the same basket. I, we talked about the former chiefs. Every chief that came in had a plan, right? Harto had her 2.0 plan. Uh, Aaron Dondo had his procedural justice plan. The new chief has his plan. Plans are great, right? But you have to get your elected officials to buy in, right? You know, we had uh, what we called years ago, we called we, uh, the PCRC uh, committee that was made up of police officers and community folks. They came up like with a bunch of action items for the department to do. And we were accomplishing no action items, right? Like making internal affairs more open for civilians to come and make a complaint. If they mm -hmm. didn't feel comfortable making a complaint, then they can go over to the Office of Police Conduct Review and make, and, and, and make a complaint. If they feel it was more safer or they could do it online. So we have, we have had all these different initiatives that over the years that we have tried to put in place, but once that chief is gone, those initiatives is gone. So 2.0, under uh, Janae Harto, we had the Office of Justice Police Programs come in and do a two-year study with community and police, and they had us ranked pretty high as one of the 
best police departments in the country. You know, the Department of Justice before that did a study on MPD, and we came out to be a very good police department, well-qualified, well-educated. But then we have the incidents with Justine Diamond get, getting shot, now they're second-guessing the, our, our recruitment of uh, uh, East African officers because it was the East African officer who did it. And then we have the Derek Chauvin situation where now we're all being scrutinized and our department is being basically saying that, you know, we're, we're, we're a, a problem organization. So, I, I, you know, in policing, policing is not a pretty job because we deal with everything that society doesn't want to deal with. Uh, you know, when people lose their lives, you know, you know, and uh, we're always going to be the boogeyman when it comes to, uh, you know, folks dying in the hand of, hands of police, if that makes sense. No, I mean, I'm really interested in the amount of responsibility that you all have now. And it's actually something we're looking at in a different documentary, not in Minneapolis. That we're looking at that right now. Um, I just had a follow up question, Inspector. So after the incidents and a lot of this, a lot of the scrutiny has happened, what are you doing yourself? I mean, I know you've been very involved in reform. You've been really active. I'm really glad you mentioned your own discrimination lawsuit. What are you doing and how do you find um, your internal sort of drive to keep working and changing and trying to reform and help others too? Well, well, this is a city. I grew up in a city in North Minneapolis, a precinct that I'm actually in charge of. So I'm here for my community, right? And they want me here. They wanted me to stay here. So I'm here to try to make sure we can get this right. There's younger officers on this department. I have a daughter who works in the Fort Precinct also. And I want to be here for her so she can make those good decisions and, and these other officers can make good decisions by my lead. Uh, it's been tough. I'm not going to tell you. I mean, at, last year I was losing cops every day, losing one or two every week and, and trying to keep, maintain staffing and respond to 911 calls. It was pretty tough, you know, and, and, our, and the violence in my precinct was pretty high last year. Uh, I have the busiest precinct in the in in the in the state. So trying to maintain that, trying to keep uh, our residents safe, it's it's been a challenge. But you know, I did not run away, and I'm not going to run away, and I'm going to continue to work and even work with the, the new chief we have, Chief uh, O'Hara. You know, and, and sometimes if we don't see eye eye to eye, that's fine. But I'm going to express the views of of our residents in North Minneapolis, and also the views of the officers of working the four precinct. Yeah, that, that's really inspiring. I, I kept wondering, like, what keeps you inspired and focused on this, especially in light of losing so many people on your force? Um, so speaking of the community, I'm glad you brought them up. It's been, it was really remarkable to see in, in Mike and Marcia's film, how the community changed and grew and, and sort of the nuance along the way. Um, Mike, I wanna just find out, first of all, what surprised you the most as you were filming the community response? Let's talk first about the community response that was really advocating for police reform. I think the very obvious uh, biggest surprise uh, was shortly after the protests uh, and the burning of the third precinct when uh, a number of city council members got up on stage and vowed to dismantle the police department. And then I think, I believe that that was the moment where uh, many of us, uh, including many police officers and Inspector Adams as well too, there's a sort of unknown that we, that we were approaching mm -hmm. towards that made it very unpredictable in terms of, well, what is the future of public safety? uh in minneapolis and beyond that uh how will the lead up to this election impact the way we see public safety and how officers and inspectors like uh charlie adams here uh have to wrestle with with that because it was a pretty uh contentious debate across the city with multiple activist community members and uh community members from multiple sides of the political debate around uh, the role of uh, the police department uh, through that time. So it was it was uh, it was pretty tense. I be honest. I think every everybody was on pins and needles. I think it was uh, made everything less trustworthy in some in some ways and more on edge. I think necessary difficult conversations was something that I'm happy that people like Labor, Marcia, and our entire team we were looking to engage with. Uh, various sides of community, as well as 
Inspector Adams. I mean, that, that's part of the reason why speaking with Inspector Adams for some time was important because Labor had even challenged me and said, if you want to know more about the, the crossroads and the intersection of how race is such an issue, both in the city and in, in general, in any system with systemic racism, uh, Charlie Adams has been there for now what, 37 years at the NPD. So that those waves of experience and seeing all these administrations, uh, uh, Charlie has uh, the insight as well as the experience that allows me, or at least challenges me to understand things differently, not only from his perspective, but how community even, uh, sort of is critical of people like Charlie and the department. So I guess, uh, Charlie, I'll ask you one more question about that. And then Marcia, I have one for you too. What, what um, when you're hearing calls for the police department to be dismantled, we were filming all of that. We actually just committed to seeing it through with Mike and let him just keep filming because we thought it was such an, such an important dialogue that was happening. What's going on with you as you're hearing that and, and your fellow police officers? So it's interesting, when they were asking for those calls and the boat was about to come up, um, I coach high school football at Minneapolis North. So some of my kids approached me and wanted to know about the, the amendment and how would that have an effect on me? And I said, you know, I probably won't have a job if that passed. You know, and they, they didn't really fully understood that mean getting rid of all of us, right? And uh, nobody really knew what that meant. And so over here in the Fort Precinct, where, like I said, it's predominantly we have, ish, you know, about crime and, and violence and stuff like that. When that vote, vote was done, North Minneapolis voted not to get rid of the cops. And that's who's most effective is the African American community. They voted not to get rid of the cops. They seen what was going on with the, you know, destructive language like dismantle, NPD, you know, uh, de defund the police officers because they start feeling the effects. Because now we start to get lawless around here. People are not stopping for stop signs, driving at high rates of speeds. Shootings have went up, carjackings had tripled, uh, robbery of persons had tripled. They started seeing the effect of all that negative talk that some of our elected officials were saying. So uh, I applaud North Minneapolis. They didn't. Want, they wanted us. And when my officers saw, saw that vote, it was actually open up in February. I mean, excuse me, up and up in December for a citywide bid, meaning an officer can leave any precinct and they can come to uh, another precinct if they have seniority. So I had a bunch of guys who on my day watch who was disgruntled, didn't like my way of, uh, of leading. Well, that's too bad. They decided to leave. So open, open, I had an open gap of a lot of people. My precinct was the first precinct that filled up. And we were shocked that the number of people that filled up and came over to work for me. So I started, you know, walking around asking officers, why did you want to be over here? It wasn't, say, it wasn't because of the action, right? It was because they knew the residents over there wanted them. And they wanted to be somewhere where they wanted to be once. So that, that shows you the power of our, our community over here in North Minneapolis, because they really- That is really power. interesting. I, you know, I didn't actually know that. I knew, I knew what had happened in North Minneapolis. I did not know that you lost people and then gained people more quickly and filled up those spots more quickly. That's really interesting, and it certainly makes a lot of sense, right, from the perspective of a police officer. Um, Marcia, talk to me about the political response and what the kind of rhetoric and the, what you were hearing on the ground. Yeah, how well, I think... I mean, I'd like to know, because we stayed there for so long, how it then changed, you know, it was really interesting. Yeah, um, well, I think... Uh, the term dismantle, uh, dismantle the police became politically radioactive quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And so everyone wanted to kind of uh, distance themselves from that term, even the people who were organizing to um, get the vote to replace the Minneapolis Police Department on the ballot. I'm sorry, there's an ambulance going by. Um, but they, they, they distanced themselves from the term dismantle and really tried to make clear that what they were looking for was to replace the police department with this holistic office of public safety and that they were not going to get completely get rid of police officers, that there would still be police officers within this office of public safety. But I think there was just so much um, 
uh, chatter and political fighting over this because it was such a hot button issue where there was misinformation on all sides. Um, and a lot of the nuances really got lost in the cracks. Um, and it was interesting because Minneapolis was not the only one who was having a vote like this. Cities across the country were having similar votes about what to do with their policing system after George Floyd's death. Um, and as Inspector Adams said, um, Minneapolis voted no. But what I think is interesting was that it was 56% of people who voted no, which to me means there was still 50 plus percent of people who wanted a change. Um, and uh, also, you know, in speaking with people across the spectrum, um, I think for the most part, people wanted some type of change, but then everyone wildly disagreed as to what that change might be like. It might just be a little bit like hire more officers who live in Minneapolis, or it might be completely replace the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, and so Minneapolis, which surprised me, was how engaged um, its residents are. They are out there protesting. They're out there having um, community chats with police officers in their backyards and their gardens. Um, they're, very, they're going to city council meetings. They're all engaged and have very strong opinions about the future of public safety in, in Minneapolis. Um, and so that to me was, was really surprising. Um, about the average Minneapolis resident, resident was just so well informed on policing. Um, and so the, the efforts to reform, to reimagine, however you want to say it, um, policing in Minneapolis did not end with the vote. Um, I know that there was another attempt um, to reimagine public safety, I think in February 2022, put forth by city council member. I don't know what what's happened with that. Um, but now we're, Minneapolis is looking um, at a consent decree, possibly two. Um, so that's going to bring about even more systemic change. So I'm not sure what that's going to do um, to the people on the ground who are looking to uh, reimagine the police department through, through a vote, through changing the city charter. I mean, I'm just curious, Inspector, from your perspective, and then Mike, I'd love you to answer this as well. I, I just don't know if you know the national scene as much, but if you look at where we are this many years after George Floyd was murdered, are you seeing the kind of changes that the community slash, well, our communities are all different, right? But let's say the politicians in that case calling for change. Are you seeing those changes happen? And if not, are you seeing some real positive changes even still? So you, you hear a lot of folks say that MPD hasn't changed one bit, right? But that's not true. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. uh, spoke to two uh, young folks who are doing uh, something similar from uh, Breck High School this morning. And we did a similar form. We were talking about policing. And I told them all the training that we had been going through since uh, this has happened. I told them I, right now I'm going through with these uh, ICS classes from 100 to 700, right? I've spent days in there getting these classes done because that was part of the state agreement that us, we, we do those, those, uh, those classes. And I have, still have classes to keep my post tests, uh, my post license available. I have to get those tests. So every day I'm doing a test. Now I explained to him, we went out to the, the gun range about a week ago and yeah, we enjoyed it. But there was one scenario where we were out there and we were and engaged with the bad guy. We were shooting back at the bad guy, and then we had a robot roll, rolling around with a gun, and we were trying to uh, take that threat out. Then there was a guy about 30 feet away, and I never shot at him. He had a knife. And so the instructor, after it was over, he says, yeah, Inspector, why didn't you shoot the guy with the knife? I said, because he wasn't a threat. Now, I tell you, 20 years ago, that with the 21 rule, he would have been shot, right? So it's already in our mindset that we're going to try to preserve life instead of trying to take somebody's life. Our chase policy right now has, has we don't chase auto thieves. You know, we have a huge problem with kids stealing Kias and Hondas who are actually driving these vehicles to, right at officers, attempting to run them over or, or damage their squad cars and then take off and they want us to chase them. And we don't. 
We don't, mm -hmm. we'll coordinate with state patrol. We'll get mm -hmm. them up the, in the air and we just watch the car from the air and then we make their arrest when they, they abandoned the vehicle. Those things didn't happen before, uh, you know, 2020, you know. We would pursue, we would do that. So those changes are being done. There's a lot of internal changes, like I said, the duty to intervene where our officers have to intervene if an officer is out of control. So, and those are ongoing courses that we continue to take every day. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Mike, I, it's it's a number of years after your film and a number of years now after George Floyd was killed. When you reflect across the country, just thinking about change in general, how are you feeling as a person who documented this for so long? I think I think what's difficult and trying to mold a couple ideas together here, but something uh, to, to what Inspector Evans was saying, is yeah, there's a lot of reform. There's a lot of pushes, especially when it comes to uh, flashpoints uh, like George Floyd's murder, like Jamar Clark and many others. And I do think uh, I credit, and, and this is more in, a, in conversations that Charlie you and I have had about even openness to reimagining police uh, activities uh, in the field. Uh, uh, mental health professionals could be used in collaboration with police officers. We've had talks about how to change and reform how things are uh, can, can be delivered in the streets. At the same time, though, uh, you are still an inspector operating at a level that has a bunch of officers beneath you. And I think uh, the rank and file on the street police officers, I think it's tough to see what kind of changes that happened on the streets from the day to day. Because at the end of the day, we police officers have interactions with community multiple times every day throughout each year. And the only way for me to understand how change is implemented or, or addressed is in the numbers, which is why that's, that, that second clip was so important because the question then becomes, not necessarily after two years, do we see fundamental change? I do think what is so important about what had happened and the sort of racial reckoning we saw with George Floyd's murder is interrogating and questioning, well, what are the issues? Marcia framed it up perfectly. Like Minneapolis is a city that is very reform-minded but it begs the question, what kind of changes happen over time and, and how do we understand the numbers? Uh, and I think now we're starting to finally uh, at least start to ask questions about these systems. Because I, I agree with Inspector Adams, I don't know that like there's an overwhelming majority of officers out there who are just out to get people, but in the micro interactions from the day to day, what can we learn about these interactions and how much of it is racially discriminatory how much of it is uh, lack of accountability? These are questions that I think have been asked over the years, but uh, I think George Floyd's murder has been shaking cities across the country about our own cities. Every city that uh, each, uh, any member of the audience uh, they live in, it challenges them to think about their own community, their own law enforcement, what their community's relationship with law enforcement. So there has been a big, I guess, inflection point in terms of being critical about law enforcement, but what that looks like now, I think we're, we're just going to have to see uh, how well Minneapolis is doing, not only after uh, Chief Arredondo, but Chief O'Hara and maybe other any other chiefs beyond that, actually. it's uh, Time will have to tell, unfortunately. With this. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, okay, Marcia, I'm just wondering, it's, it's also been some time, you're working on a different project now. What stays with you the most from that experience? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think what stays with me the most is that um, that change takes a very long time. Um, you know, going back deep into the history of you know policing in Minneapolis and seeing that the city has really struggled um, for decades and decades um, to deal with. Um, problem officers using excessive force against non-white populations and going through this cycle again and again, but that there is such an engaged um, citizenry that is, you know, protesting, advocating for reform. There's police officers like Charlie Adams um, who are working from within, who have sued the police department um, on a discrimination basis. Um, you know, it's, and just working on the film for over a year with Mike, I felt myself going through that cycle where it was protest mm -hmm. after protest. There were 
multiple killings after George Floyd's killing that we also filmed. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt that um, the heaviness of that cycle, and I don't even live in Minneapolis, but I was following the news cycle. And so I was, um, you know, just really um, inspired by people on all sides of the spectrum who were still so engaged with this issue and really trying to push forth what they thought their vision um, their vision of policing and public safety in, in Minneapolis. Um, uh, even though, you know, you take one step forward and you might take five steps backwards, um, but they're still so engaged. And um, to me, even though, you know, it's, uh, I don't, it's, it's a big spectrum um, across the board in terms of like what people were pushing for, but just their, level of engagement year after year um, mm -hmm. was um, uh, just really inspiring. So Inspector Adams, I want to end with you. And I just was so curious. You worked with Mike Shum. You've worked with many reporters and journalists. Thank you for, first of all, talking to journalists. It's really important that we have your perspective. I just want to thank you for that because so few officers do, especially at your level. What motivates you to talk to us? You know, I have a good friend who was a investigative reporter for WCCO News back in the days, Caroline Lowe. She's kind of my education mentor. She hounded me to get my master's and my, uh, uh, my master's degree and my BA degree. So she always had told me, I'm going to do the story without 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 you if you don't tell me what's going on right so most of the times i tell our administration and our pios we have to help craft the message we cannot just let it be one-sided uh we have to be able to tell our, our side of the story and usually when we do it may not come out as bad as we thought it thought it was going to come out it may come out balanced right so that's why i've always been that way and i learned that from her and i you know i've talked to many other you know publications, uh, you know, and I've been very honest and open. I think that's what people want to hear from you. Um, is there issues in law enforcement? Absolutely. Does things need to change? Absolutely. And I think it needs to start when we with recruitment and when we go into the academy. We need to get away from this part military organization. We need to start teaching our young cops how to be people and how to re relate to folks, right? Not that I'm the, I'm the police and you do what I say, right? We got to get away from that. That's no longer, I didn't like it when I was going through it 30 years, 36, 37 years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that training then. And, uh, and I don't like it now. So until we start treating these, these recruits as, 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 as young, as young folks, adults, and giving them the, the, the tools that go out in the community and be successful and be a uh, service to the community. I, I don't think things are going to change if we stay in that same path. And that's why I'm still here to make sure we can make those changes. Oh, that's a wonderful ending thought. Mike, Marcia, and Inspector Adams, thank you so much for joining me today. Really been a wonderful discussion. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Randy.